This is Vet Tales, the story of the Sailing Veterinary Clinic. We are slowly making our way to La Paz. Last episode, we sailed from Isla San Francisco to Isla Espiritu Santos. This episode, Mr. Atticus Guy and I take you all on a crash course on pet first aid. I'd like to begin by saying this is generalized advice and may not be appropriate for your pet. So be sure to talk to your own veterinarian about the best thing for your pet and their needs. Addie and I are here on board Chuff today to talk to you all about pet first aid and how you can apply it on a boat. So Addy is going to be our demonstration. We do have a longer version video of this that's more just a slideshow, so you can look through it for more information. But today we're going to demonstrate everything on Mr. Guy here. To begin pet first aid, we need a first aid kit. Human first aid kits can be used on your pet and they contain a lot of the things that we need. I would suggest, however, having a special thermometer for the dogs and cats since that's going into their bottom. We don't want to use that on people. Stethoscopes can be useful but not mandatory. Like I will explain later, you can also feel for the heart and listen in other ways. Scissors and, and tweezers and that kind of thing are useful. Gauze for putting pressure on wounds or cleaning wounds. Gloves are useful again for when dealing with wounds or messy situations. Bandaging material, some sort of antiseptic to clean wounds with. And then some other useful things to carry for pets in your first aid kit is some medicine. So wound creams can be useful. Ear and eye ointment. Ear infections are very common in boat dogs because they're getting their little ears wet. Oh, sorry, I'm putting everything on top of you. Let me move that, fuck you. Yeah, ear ointments are very useful in boat dogs because they do often get ear infections when they go swimming. And then some medicine. So this is a medicine called Meloxicam. It is an anti-inflammatory medication and pain relief for dogs and cats available at the veterinarian. There are other brands and other names of this type of drug, but that can be a really good idea to carry something that provides anti-inflammatory for fevers, anti-inflammatory for um, swellings, and also pain relief. Another useful thing to carry is some sort of antibiotic. I would suggest carrying at least a 10 day course of a broad spectrum antibiotic, amoxicillin clavulanic acid, which is what this is, is a good example of that. Um, again, available at your veterinarian, and I highly suggest taking your dog or cat in for a checkup and to talk to your veterinarian before you go cruising or on a big holiday to get all of this stuff. And finally, another really important thing is anti-nausea medication. This is metoclopramide, which dogs can take, um, and cats, dogs and cats can both take metoclopramide. Um, there are many other medications. Serenia is a really good option, but again, talk to you a bit about the best option, but taking something for nausea in particular for seasickness is a very good idea for your pet in your first aid kit. So first we're gonna talk about vital signs. So that's actually checking what might be wrong with your pet. Some useful tools for that is a stethoscope and a thermometer. Now, you all know how to take temperature on dogs and cats, or most of you should. This does go up the bottom. That's how we take their temperature. So in a dog, the normal temperature is around 38 to 39 degrees Celsius, which is the same in a cat. Um, that is 100.4 to 100.2, no, 102.5 Fahrenheit. So our Aussies aren't so good with our Fahrenheit. So some other things you can check on your dog or cat is lifting their lips and checking the color of their gums. Now, most dogs and cats have pink gums. You can see Addies are a little black, but if we look really closely in the corner here, there's a spot of pink. And if I press that and release it, it refills right away. And that shows me his blood pressure is good because the heart's pumping the blood to refill those capillaries nice and quickly. So that's a really easy test you can do. If it's slow and takes longer than two seconds, that's generally a sign they're dehydrated or their heart's not pumping as well as it should. So for example, they might be in shock um, or like I said, they could be dehydrated or getting sick. So that's a really good one to check. Next, we will have a listen to his heart. It's easiest to hear the heart on the left side of a dog or cat 
just behind their elbow is the best place to pop the stethoscope. Addy has a nice slow heartbeat. The normal heart rate for a dog his size is around 60 to 80 beats per minute. Smaller dogs is higher, so like 100 to 120 beats per minute, and cats are even higher again. So cats can have a heart rate of around 150 or even higher if they're a little bit stressed. If you don't have a stethoscope, you can also feel the heart. So by putting your hand gently on the left side of the chest, right under their elbow here, I can really easily feel Addy's heartbeat and that can help me count it as well. Another really easy thing to do is count their respiratory rate, which is how fast they're breathing. You can do that by listening to their breath with a stethoscope, but you can also just watch the side of their chest and you'll see the gentle expansion and depression of their chest as they breathe. Normal is under 30 breaths per minute. If it's higher than 30 breaths per minute, that's usually a sign that they're either too hot, they're struggling to get enough air, they're stressed, or that they're unwell. So it's also quite easy to take the pulse rate of a dog or cat in the femoral artery. So the femoral artery runs just down the middle of the thigh here on the inside of their leg. You just place your hand here like this, press gently. One, two, three, four, five. He's got quite a slow heart rate, which is good. It means he's nice and relaxed and healthy. Hey, my boy. An important thing to know how to do is how to do a bandage properly. So these are the three materials you'll need. The first is a non-adherent dressing. The non-adherent dressing is placed over the wound and as the name suggests, it doesn't stick to the wound, it can be peeled off later. We then have a cotton conforming bandage that can be used as a nice padded second layer. And then this is called Coflex or Vet Wrap. It is an extremely useful bandage that can be used as an outer layer. It sticks to itself but it doesn't stick to the patient, which is very important in furry creatures, especially for cats. It can really hurt them when you rip the, rip the bandage off, hey. So let's put a bandage on Addy. Let's pretend he's hurt his foot here or his leg here. We would first place the non-stick dressing down over the wound. We would then start just above the wound with our conforming bandage or our cotton bandage. We want this one to be firm but not too tight. And then we're gonna basically overlap it halfway so that each layer of the bandage crosses halfway with the layer below. And we're gonna go all the way to his toes, but leave two toes out. The reason we leave a couple of toes out is it allows us to check if there's any swelling or purpleness or anything like that at the very end of his feet, which means our bandage is too tight. Next, we're going to do our outer layer. As you can see, it sticks to itself. Very useful. I like to pull a little bit of this bandage out first so it doesn't end up too tight. And then we're going to do a similar thing where we're lapping about halfway over each layer. Starting at the top, working our way down. And voila! Addy's wound has been bandaged. As you can see, he was a well-behaved patient. <laughs> Good boy. Now, this bandage is appropriate for a wound, but obviously if he had a fractured leg, there's a lot of movement here. In which case, if they ever do fracture a leg, sometimes it's better just to leave it because obviously it's gonna be very painful and trying to touch it a lot is no good. Dogs and cats have four legs, which means usually they'll just hold the broken one up. So that's perfectly okay for a short period of time. If you do have to bandage it, we're gonna use a lot more of this layer. So we're gonna go up and down the leg a few times, always finishing, starting from the top and then finishing coming down. You can also put splints in. So it's okay to use something like a thin piece of wood. And then basically what you wanna do is put a layer or two of this, your splint, another layer or two of your cotton bandage, and then put your nice um, outer layer on afterwards. If your dog or cat has a bleeding wound, bandaging it can help slow, the br slow it down. Just simply putting pressure on with some gauze, which we have here. So let's say Addy's bleeding from the foot here. We can simply hold this on, apply pressure for a few minutes. Every three minutes we check, 
and more often than not that's enough to stop a bleed if not we can then apply a bandage for more serious bleeds something else you can do to slow down the the flow of blood is put pressure on the major arteries so we can put pressure in the armpit here this is where a lot of the major arteries and veins are so it can help slow slow down the flow of blood and we can also put pressure in the groin here again that can help slow down the flow of blood while you get a bandage on so now we're going to talk about cpr which is cardiopulmonary resuscitation which basically means cardio heart pulmonary breathing lungs and resuscitating to try and get it going again now the first step before you start cpr is checking that your pet actually needs it so some things you can do is check their blink response you can see Addy blinks when I touch his eyes, which is a sign that he's conscious. Generally, conscious animals will have some control of their breathing and heart rate. The other thing to do is watch for breaths. So we can see Addy is breathing. Check whether there is a pulse or not. If they're not breathing, we do resuscitation of the lungs. So we can do breathing resuscitation. If they have no pulse, that's when we do chest compressions. So first of all, let's talk about breathing resuscitation, which can be used, for example, in drowning cases. Before you start breathing resuscitation, you also want to extend their head and neck. You can check that there's nothing inside their mouth, do a mouth sweep. Then we're going to make the seal and do the breathing. With a dog and cat, what we're going to do is put our hand around their mouth to close it, block off their nostrils, and then breathe into their nostrils. <laughs> I'm not going to actually do that to Mr. Guy since he is a conscious dog. Um, but as we do that, as we breathe in, their lungs will inflate. We then pull away, the chest deflates, and we continue to do that. If they need chest compressions, in a large dog, we are actually able to do it kind of similar to a person where we're gonna place our hand just behind the elbow there on their chest, which is roughly where their heart is, and we're gonna begin compressions. For smaller animals, you can just use a hand like this and just do the compressions with your hand. So it's particularly a cat or a little dog around five to 10 kilos. Some large chested dogs, like a bulldog, will actually lay on their back and do them more like a human to get enough compression. But we want to be compressing the chest around a third to halfway down. So it's quite a long way and does require some force. To get an idea of how fast to do it, once again, similar to humans, ah, 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 staying alive, staying alive. <laughs> roughly 100 beats per minute. Whenever doing any form of resuscitation, whether it's the breathing or the chest compressions, we do want to pause periodically and check whether we have a pulse again or whether they're breathing spontaneously again. So roughly every two minutes, pause for 15 seconds, watch for a breath, feel for a pulse, and then begin again. Yes, hey. Oh look, he's alive. Thank God. <laughs> Another important first aid tool with dogs and cats is getting them hydrated if they're ever dehydrated. This can happen from vomiting, um, diarrhea, also just from heat stroke. There's lots of things that can cause dehydration. So there's a few options. One is to just give oral fluids. So if they can keep food down and keep water down, they can just have oral fluids. You can add electrolyte solutions to it. So even human electrolyte solutions are okay provided they don't have any artificial sweeteners in them. So that's very important to check for. Um, or you can even just add a little honey or bone broth, something to encourage them to drink a lot of water. They will eventually hydrate that way. Another option is obviously we can give intravenous fluids, but that's something that can be really difficult to do. It's hard to get pets to stay still. It's difficult enough for veterinarians to know how to do that, let alone people who aren't used to handling animals in that way. Something that's much easier is to set up your fluid bag with the extension set like you normally would for intravenous fluids in humans and to give them subcutaneously in dogs and cats. That's basically when we give it under the skin. As you can see, Addy is a good example. He has a lot of skin here. That can be filled with water like a camel and then slowly it gets absorbed. And this is a really good hydration technique to use in animals that aren't holding water down and can't are vomiting it up. So basically what we do is we just lift up the skin on the back of the neck here, kind of between the shoulder blades and form a little tent. We get our needle, we pop it in there, attach it to our fluid bag, and open it up and just let water go in. The important thing is to not do more than 50 milliliters in any one site. Addy potentially could take a little more than that, but particularly in small animals. Um, for larger breed dogs like this, we could do around 200 milliliters at a time. For smaller dogs, we're gonna be doing smaller amounts, like 100 milliliters. And then we can repeat that throughout the day to try and get them better hydrated.
This is just a brief overview of pet first aid and mostly demonstrating the more practical elements on an actual live patient for you all. You can listen to a longer talk that I've given uh, that is on our YouTube channel. We'll put a little link in um, that talks for about an hour on pet first aid and includes slides. But again, please talk to your own veterinarian about what's best for your pet and get their advice on what you should carry in your pet first aid kit, as well as the things you can do to take good care of them on the boat. Thank you for watching our practical video on pet first aid. If you found this video helpful, consider making a donation or becoming a patron to support our veterinary projects in the Sea of Cortez. Until next episode, stay chuffed everybody.